Hello and welcome to Chapel. Over the next few weeks with Mr. Lee, we're going to be going through the different emotions that we all experience um, from the movie Inside Out. This week, we're going to be going through the emotion of joy. So follow me as we ask people what makes them feel joy. Uh, what makes me feel joy is uh, hanging out with my mates like Sam and uh, being around the boys at school and playing footy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what makes me feel joyful is uh, also hanging around my mates. Uh, I love to get around the sport, get around the boys. Cricket's a, cricket's a great one at the moment. Uh, something that brings me great joy is being filmed for chapel videos. I love that. Something that brings me joy is uh, good food and hanging out with friends and a really good game of rugby. All right, so what brings me joy? Uh, I think lying on the couch watching test cricket brings me a lot of joy. Uh, falling asleep on the couch with the test cricket in the background, that's, that's even better. But on a more serious note, uh, I think just my family really, um, my kids and my wife, they give me a lot of joy. Something that brings me joy is being outside in sunshine. Doesn't matter what I'm doing, if it's outside, I'm happy. So something that definitely makes me joyful is doing things for other people. So I love to buy flowers for someone or do little small gestures for people, something just to cheer them up and make their day. So what brings me joy? Um, spending time with my friends and family definitely brings me joy. Well, um, the things that bring me joy, um, definitely playing sport. It's a thing I look forward to playing after school every day. It brings me the most joy. Uh, what makes me happy is when I get to spend time with my friends and have heaps of fun. So what brings me joy is uh, seeing people strive for things and achieve them. Uh, what brings me joy is a wide blue ocean with waves crashing through it. And what brings me joy is my children, seeing them achieve and grow in wisdom and stature with our good Lord. Yeah, something that makes me joyful is uh, driving along country roads. I like landscapes. so. Uh, spending time with the family on road trips. Okay, some of the things that bring me joy, a really long run, a nice Diet Coke with five ice cubes in it. Uh, when I see my sport teams winning, uh, the joy on my daughter's face when her parents come home and they see her, uh, or she sees them, and like a really good crumbed lamb cutlet meal. Delicious. What brings me joy? Uh, there are many things that bring me joy. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is probably the smell of good food. That, that makes me feel happy and uh, joyful straight away. But uh, what also brings me joy uh, is both as a teacher and coach is, you know, if a kid gets a concept that you've been trying to teach them uh, and you can see that they understand it, that brings me joy. Or if I'm teaching someone a new part of, a, say, a volleyball drill or a, a really difficult skill and uh, I can see that they've used it in a game situation, that actually really brings me joy and that's why I love my job. Um. Uh, the things that bring me joy are being at home with my wife and my two dogs, spending time with close friends and family, um, afternoons where I get to head out for a kayak and enjoy some, uh, some recreation on the water, reading a great book in the sunshine over summer, and also I think the most important thing uh, that brings me joy is having purpose in life and uh, knowing that God has a purpose for all of us and that I have been fortunate enough, blessed enough to find my purpose and I try to use uh, my skills, my abilities, limited though they are, to hopefully bring some, some good into the world uh, for the glory of God. In 2015, Pixar Animation Studios released one of its most ambitious projects to date. A kids film in which the main characters were not toys, cars, robots, monsters, dinosaurs, or even cute and cuddly fish, but abstract emotions. It was a big gamble, but if anyone was going to be able to pull it off, it was Pixar, and they did. Inside Out was not only a huge commercial success, it was a hit with the critics, it won a ton of awards, including the Oscar for Best Animated Feature, and perhaps most impressively, it gave audiences a new way to talk about feelings. Inside Out stars five emotions, joy, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust, personified as five colorful characters living inside the mind of an 11-year-old girl named Riley. Together, these emotions try to help Riley navigate through life as she and her family move to a new city. And to do this, they each take turns operating a control panel called the console, 
which determines how Riley reacts and responds to her changing circumstances, depending who's pushing the buttons. Uh, Inside Out is a fun and fascinating exploration of the kind of influence our emotions have over our decision making, and consequently, how our emotions actually shape our lives. Now, as I mentioned before, this week in chapel, we're beginning a new series exploring the topic of human emotions. The plan is that each week, We'll look at one of the five emotions from inside out. We'll try to get our heads around it. And we'll learn what the God of the Bible has to say about it. Today, we're starting with joy. And in Inside Out, joy looks like this. Voiced by actress Amy Poehler, a.k.a. Leslie Note from Parks and Recreation, joy is, as you'd expect, fun and bubbly and bright. She's full of energy, creativity and positivity but she's also fairly manic and a little bit of a control freak. And that's because her goal is to make sure that Riley is always happy. And let's face it, it's hard work trying to keep someone happy for every moment of every day. Most of us know this from experience. For most of us, if we're not busy trying to keep ourselves happy, we're busy trying to keep someone else happy. And I don't know if you've noticed, but happiness is kind of a big deal these days. Parents are constantly talking about how they just want their kids to be happy. Top universities now offer graduate level courses on happiness. And according to a number of studies conducted around the world, the desire for happiness is second only to the desire for health and a long life, which means that those surveyed ranked it as more important than sex, more important than having a good job, more important than having wealth, status, or being a celebrity. Everyone, it seems, wants to be happy. So how do we get happy? Well, a lot of us have this underlying assumption that the key to happiness is doing more of what you love and less of what you hate. We tend to think that if we could just remove all discomfort from our lives, everything that annoys us, everything that frustrates us, everything that makes us unhappy, well, then we'd be happy. This is Marie Kondo, star of the hit Netflix reality TV series, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. Now, on her show, Mari visits different families to help them organize and declutter their homes by applying the KonMari method. Now, what's the KonMari method? Basically, it involves going through every item in your house and only keeping the things that spark joy, the things that make you happy. Anything that does not spark joy was to be discarded, donated or thrown out. Now, as someone who has a tendency towards being overly sentimental, I'm actually really drawn to this method. Uh, After all, I've got boxes of stuff at home that need culling. And it makes me wonder, could I apply the KonMari method to other areas of my life as well? I mean, what if I applied it to the music that I listen to or the books that I read? That might not be so bad. What if I applied it to the shows I watch on TV? or the social media accounts that I interact with. There'd probably be some good in that. But what if I applied it to my diet? What if I said, you know what, eating vegetables and drinking water doesn't really spark joy for me. So from now on, I'm just going to live off pizza and ice cream and Coke. I think we all know how that would go. What if I applied it to my job? What if I said, well, I don't really get much of a thrill from marking assessments and writing reports and..." In fact, those things are kind of more likely to kill my joy rather than to spark it, so I'm just going to stop doing them altogether. What if I applied it to my classes? What if I went around the students in the room and said, you know what, you spark joy, you spark joy, you spark joy, but you two over there, you've got to go. Obviously, I could never do that, and not just because I'd lose my job. I couldn't do that because life, real life anyway, It doesn't work like that. In real life, we don't get to discard everything that doesn't spark joy. You might be able to con Murray your wardrobe, but you can't con Murray your life. No one can be happy all the time, no matter how hard they try. Life has a habit of getting in the way. Uh, It rains on your birthday. COVID restrictions tighten up just before that concert. You spend half your Saturday driving all the way to Knox, only to lose the game by 50. True story. Bad things happen. People are annoying. Work is tiring. Not to mention 
that you and I live in a world that is full of mess, hurt, and heartache. A world in which there are endless stories of abuse and slavery and poverty, where our environment is under threat and where sickness and disease run rife. A world where despite living the kind of lives that our grandparents could only dream of, we find ourselves in the midst of an epidemic of childhood and adulthood depression. See, our world is in many respects a pretty unhappy place. And if it doesn't totally suck for me, then you could bet it totally sucks for someone else. It's for this reason that the famous writer David Maloof in his essay, The Happy Life, pretty much concludes that you can't be happy unless you bury your head in the sand and forget what the world's really like. And no one can do that for more than a moment. As a result, our happiness, our joy, well, it ends up being rather fragile and fleeting. Uh, in the words of this famous TV character, happiness is merely the moment before you need more happiness. It doesn't last. It comes and goes as quickly as the weekend or the last school holidays. One minute you're up, and the next you're back down again. It's like trying to hold a cup of water in your hand. You can do it for a second or two, but before long it's slipping through your fingers and you've got to start all over again. Is it possible to have a joy or a happiness that is more substantial than that? Is it possible to have a joy or a happiness that you can actually hold on to so that it lasts longer than the moment? Well, the Bible says, yes, it is possible. And that's because in the Bible, joy is more than an emotional response to happy circumstances. It's an attitude of hope. Hope in the promises of God Faith in the love of God. This is how in the Bible God's people are able to sing for joy even as they are lost in the desert. Even as they are conquered and oppressed by foreign empires. Even as they suffer under intense persecution including martyrdom. See in the Bible the hope that God will one day deliver his people enables them to not only endure great adversity but to rejoice in the very midst of it. Take the Apostle Paul for example. In the opening chapter of his letter to the Philippians, Paul says, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. What is it that had happened to Paul? Well, what you've got to realize is that when Paul wrote these words back in 61 AD, he did so from a dirty Roman prison in which he'd already spent four years and where he was actually facing execution. He was not in a happy place. And yet, he chooses to rejoice. Why? Because he had hope. See, Paul believed that the death and resurrection of Jesus had overcome everything, even death itself. And that meant that regardless of whatever happened to him in that dirty Roman prison, he was known by God, he was loved by God, and he was destined to be with God in paradise for all eternity. And when you have hope like that, well, suddenly joy becomes reasonable in even the darkest of circumstances. Paul called this the joy of faith or joy in the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong here. This kind of joy doesn't mean that Christians are people who are happy all the time. It's not as though Christians are robots who don't feel any pain. And if you read Paul's letters, you'll find that he often expresses real pain Pain at missing loved ones, pain at losing friends, pain at losing his own freedom. And in fact, you may have noticed in our reading that he is so pain in prison, he even expresses a desire to die. Yet at the same time, he is still able to rejoice because he had a greater lens through which to interpret that pain, the lens of hope. See, biblical joy is an attitude of hope in the promises of God of faith in the love of God, both of which find their fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus. And when you have that kind of joy in your heart, you can endure pretty much anything because you've got a shelter from the storm. You've got something to hold on to instead of water slipping through your fingers. Having biblical joy gives you a reason to get back up again when life knocks you down. And having biblical joy frees you from the tiring work of having to put a positive spin on every moment of every day. And it means that your life doesn't have to be one big culling project 
desperately trying to rid yourself of everything that fails to spark joy. Personally, for me, it means I can eat those vegetables. I can write those reports. I can navigate those difficult moments with students and even endure much harder, much more tragic and more traumatic experiences without being crushed or feeling as though my life's been ruined. Because in the hope of Jesus, I've got a joy that nothing can take away. Now, in Inside Out, Joy eventually learns that it isn't realistic for Riley to be happy all the time, and that it's pointless to try and force otherwise. If anything, putting pressure on Riley to be happy all the time leads her to become more and more unhappy. And in this beautiful irony, Riley actually experiences a deeper sense of happiness when she's able to acknowledge and express the full range of emotions. Now, this is closer to biblical joy. Because biblical joy is not the absence of negative emotions. It's not the absence of sadness or the absence of fear, but rather it's hope in the midst of sadness, hope in the face of fear. Biblical joy is about having hope, hope in the promises of God, hope in the love of God, hope in Jesus, the one who endured the cross, that you and I might know true and lasting joy in both this life and the next. So choose hope, choose to rejoice, choose joy.